Good morning, PUC, and welcome to the third day of Week of Prayer. So I'm going to be announcing the winners of the PUC Essay Talent Show. In first place, we have Luminous. In second, we have Greg and his friends. And in third, we have Angel. So congratulations to everyone who won, and thank you to everyone who participated. Have a good day, guys, and enjoy the rest of the program.
Good morning once again. Welcome to day three of our new normal virtual week of prayer. I'm so happy you've joined me again today. Yesterday's message was entitled Suffering and Comfort. We use 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 through 7 as our anchor text and we discovered three things about suffering and comfort. First, God gives comfort to his children through every bit of suffering. Even though we endure tribulation, God does not leave us alone to bear it all by ourselves. God gives us comfort for every bit of suffering that we endure. Secondly, we learned that when we participate in the sufferings of Christ, God gives comfort in proportion to the amount of suffering that we receive. This was encouraging to us because if we suffer at a level 10, that means that God's comfort will be at least at a level 10 as well. But when we are suffering because we went against God's will or willfully departed from His plan, He does not offer the same service. Yes, He gives us grace, but His special matching comfort is reserved for when we suffer on His behalf. And then thirdly, we learn that both suffering and comfort are God's tools used to secure our salvation. God desperately wants to save all of us because of His love for us, and He will sometimes allow us to experience some temporary pain in order to win us back to Him, because this is all about our salvation. That was suffering and comfort yesterday. This morning, I want to expand on the subject of suffering just a bit, focusing specifically on the fact that we have a loving and caring God, using the title, God Cares. Let's pray. Father, allow us to see your love through your Son, Jesus Christ, today. In His name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6-10 through 10 in the NIV, the Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter has just written to the church in the previous chapter about experiencing suffering. You see, Peter's book fits into a category of writing known as a general epistle. That is, a letter that was meant for general circulation amongst a group of churches as opposed to one church in particular. You know how 1 Corinthians was written to, by Paul to the church in Corinth? And Romans was written by Paul to the church in Rome? Well, Peter's letter was not written to any specific church, but instead was meant for general circulation. Hence the name general epistle. And during the time period of his writing, the Christian church was facing persecution. And as we all know, persecution involves suffering. So Peter was trying to prepare his readers in chapter 4 for the suffering that would most certainly befall them by saying, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His sufferings, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. That's 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 16 in the New Living Translation. 
Now, we saw much of this same sentiment in our message yesterday as we examined suffering and comfort and how God uses those for our salvation. We reviewed that that sermon just a few minutes ago, and so I'm sure you can hear the similarities now in Peter's letter. I like what Peter says here, though, because he reframes suffering as a positive thing, not just for salvation, but also for connecting with Christ at a deeper level right now. Peter tells us that we should be very glad because the trials we suffer make us partners with Christ in His suffering. That sounds like a positive thing, even though we all know that the word suffering is largely negative to us. But Peter is trying to change the mindset of his readers with regard to tribulation, and he wants to do the same to us today as well. You see, Peter's mind was changed on this subject too. In fact, when you really think about it, it's very interesting that Peter would be the one to give us such a convincing message about the positive attributes of suffering because of what we know about his own attitude towards the subject. Do you remember back in Matthew when Jesus told his men that he must go through suffering? Peter, actually hearing this, got upset and he actually pulled Jesus to the side and rebuked him. Listen for yourself. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Wow. Can you imagine taking God aside and reprimanding him? Peter is chastising Jesus off to the side now. And this underscores our instinctive human reaction to the subject of suffering. It's so offensive to Peter that he pulls the Savior of the world to the side and rebukes him. So Peter was very much anti-suffering while Jesus was here on this earth. And his attitude was that if anyone deserves suffering and should endure it, it should not be the God of the universe. Suffering was anathema to Peter, but now he understands it better, and he wants his readers to be prepared for what they will have to endure. You see, no one likes to suffer, but we usually like the results of suffering. It's what comes after suffering that is so beneficial to us, and many of us know what that feels like. At the beginning of this very quarantine, April and I noticed right away that something major had changed with our bodies in particular because we weren't as active as we used to be. There's a certain hustle and bustle that is present in normal life that was absent now that we had begun to work from home. And some of the areas of our bodies began to grow and expand without our even realizing it, especially around the midsection. Maybe you've seen the same thing in your circumstance. <laughs> so we decided to pull out some old workout DVDs that we used to use back in the day. It's a program called P90X. It's a 90-day workout program that transformed our health in a major way back in 2008. Now, I need you to understand that this workout program is hard. When I say hard, I mean really hard. Each day involves anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half of workout time. And you follow this calendar and it tells you which video you're supposed to do on what day. Some days you're using weights, some days it's cardio, other days it's yoga. But the X in P90X stands for extreme, and you better believe this thing is really hard. The reason the program is so effective is because it employs a technique 
called muscle confusion. It's to help you get better results. You see, our bodies were fearfully and wonderfully made. They're designed to adapt so that we can endure new circumstances. So what happens in a normal workout program is that after a few weeks, your body gets used to the workout and you no longer see the gains that you were seeing early on in the early stages of your workout because now your body has adjusted and is used to the routine. Well, what P90X does is that it changes the workout routines every three weeks so that your body can't get used to it, therefore producing better results in the three month period than you normally would get. So this means you basically spend most of the three months feeling sore and achy because you're using new muscles all the time and you're pushing them to the extreme limits every single time you work out. Now guys, I need you to know that this is basically three months of suffering. Anyone who has done any form of extreme workout program will know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've done P90X and you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> the suffering hurts at the time and it's painful and sometimes you want to give up. But the results in the end are well worth it. In the end, you end up, as April puts it, being able to go shopping in your own closet. You know what that means? That's, that's a way of saying that you lose so much weight that now you can fit all kinds of clothes that were in the back of your closet that you've been neglecting for years because they've been too small. <laughs> no need to go shopping in an actual store. You can shop in your own closet after P90X. The suffering is well worth it in the end. Believe you me. <laughs> uh, I need you to know and this is the reality that Peter came to understand as he really began to look into what Jesus was talking about when he predicted his death. No one likes suffering at the time, but God designed us to be able to react and respond to suffering in profound ways. And there are some things in your life right now that you would never be able to achieve without suffering. And God knows that. So. As we saw on the other day, just yesterday, he's right there with us all the time to give us comfort in proportion to the suffering we endure. But one more thing, God actually cares. He cares about you all along. And how do I know that? Well, it's in chapter 5 of Peter's general epistle to the church. Peter has just finished talking about suffering, and now he shifts a bit to talk about relationships within the church and between leadership and such. And we find these beautiful words after that. Here they are. Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Peter says very plainly that we can bring all of our worries and our cares and our anxieties and our fears to the feet of Jesus, and He will take them because He cares about us. That's an amazing thing to contemplate because we live in a world where almost 8 billion people live. And yet Peter is saying that God cares about you as an individual. That's amazing to me. God cares about me? And according to Peter, God wants us to bring all of our cares to Him. He doesn't qualify the level of importance. He says that the reason God cares about even the little stuff we care about is because He cares about us. So he's saying that if something concerns us, it concerns God because he cares about us. That's amazing to me. <laughs> I remember my father-in-law telling me a story that, that illustrates this point. He was in his front yard mowing his lawn, and, and suddenly in the middle of the mow, a bolt slipped off the handle of the mower, making it impossible for it to be pushed anymore. So my pop, he, he stooped down and stopped the mower and began to look in the grass for that missing bolt. As he began looking in the general vicinity of the mower, he couldn't find anything. He knew it must be somewhere in the grass, but he found nothing. He started to get a bit more frantic in his search because he needed to get this grass cut. He had things he had to do. So he, he widened his search parameters and, and looked up and down the lawn, even in places that really hadn't been cut yet, just in case the bolt ended up there. You, you know how we get sometimes when we're looking for something and we've looked everywhere and we can't find it? We start looking in places there's no way it could be there, but we look anyway because we want to make sure we cover all of our bases. That's what he did. Eventually, other people around the neighborhood started noticing, his neighbors, that, that he was actually doing this, so they joined in the search with him, and they couldn't find it either. 
After about solid 30 minutes of searching, something said to him, Have you prayed yet? And immediately he felt ashamed that he had not asked God for his help. But when he thought about it, he said, You know what? This is probably too small for God. He wouldn't have time for this. But now he was desperate. He needed to find that bolt. And he'll do anything. So he said, Let me pray. Because he felt so bad about not having prayed in the first place, he decided that he would kneel down in the grass and take this more seriously. He got down on his knees and he said, Father, I'm sorry it took me so long to ask for your help, but as you can see, I really need it now. Lord, if you have time, would you please help me find this missing bolt so that I can finish my lawn? In Jesus' name, amen. And just as he was finishing up his prayer, he felt something on his left knee. It was hurting. It felt like he was kneeling on something. When he got up, he looked under his left, left knee, and guess what? Lo and behold, that missing bolt. My pop never rejoiced so loudly in his life. He thanked God, and he screwed that bolt back into place, and he finished up that lawn. That day, my pop understood 1 Peter 5, 7 in a whole new way. I don't care what it is. You might think it's too small for God to care, but my pop will tell you that there is nothing too small for God to care about. If it concerns you, it concerns him because he cares about you. Our God really cares. He cares enough to prepare us for the bad times, and he cares enough to be with us through those tough times. He cares enough to prepare a way of escape for temptation, and He cares enough to guide you through your hardships. God cares about the big things, and He cares about the little things. He cares enough to send His only Son, and He cared enough to do nothing while His Son died on the cross for you and for me. God really cares. You see, it may not feel like that sometimes, but we've got to trust that He cares about us because He told us in His Word that He does. Sometimes we just have to cling to the promises of God, knowing that they are true, even when everything around us seems to be telling us the opposite. God actually cares. And here's the part of Peter's text that I love so much. Listen to what he says in verse 10 in the NLT. In His kindness... God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, He will restore, support, and strengthen you, and He will place you on a firm foundation. You see that? Our suffering isn't for nothing. It ultimately leads to our salvation, and Jesus will be there with us through the entire thing. The suffering will only last a little while. And then God will restore us and support us and strengthen us and place us on a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Wow, our God really does care. I know sometimes it may not feel like it, but God is concerned with you. He cares about what's happening in your life. And maybe you feel like God doesn't care about you at all because of the way things are happening. You, you think He's too busy uh, to be concerned about you or, or that you're insignificant. But I'm here to tell you right now that none of that is true. Those are all lies from the devil. God cares about you as an individual. Yes, you. And the proof that he cares is that he sent his one and only son just to save you. Won't you surrender to Jesus today? I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for that person who has decided today to surrender to you. Lord, one of these PUC students is listening right now and they're saying that they've been in despair because of the circumstances of their lives and they have bought into the lie of the devil that you don't care about them. But now they have been encouraged by this text in 1 Peter and they recognize right now that God actually does care about them. So Lord, I'm asking that you would restore their confidence in you today. Remind them that even though the circumstances around them are happening in a crazy way, that you are there right with them to hold their hand and to hold them up. Lord, remind that person today and may they be encouraged to give their life completely over to you. So that when you are seen coming in the clouds of glory, and we know that day is coming soon, 
They will be ready to go home with you along with the rest of us. Bring that day in the worthy name of Jesus. Let everybody who loves God say together, Amen and Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow at this same time. I can't wait to see you again. I hope you'll be here too. God bless.